live streaming. Here we go. This is TV time here, so hang on. Good evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca Price with the Nashville Public Library Special Collections Division, which is right upstairs on the second floor and home to two of Nashville's beloved community spaces, the Civil Rights Room and the Votes for Women's Room. If you haven't visited those spaces yet, I invite you all to return and explore these places that tell the stories and share, experience, share experiences of Nashville's rich and diverse history. I am gonna need these. <laughs> <laughs> I want to welcome everyone to Nashville Public Library for this evening's second program in this series, Then and Now, The History of Nashville's Minority Communities, presented by Vanderbilt University. Nashville's Public Library Special Collections is honored to host and co-present this new and exciting series. And we are thankful to all of you here tonight and for those of you watching live on YouTube. A couple of housekeeping issues. If you haven't already, please remember to validate your parking ticket if you parked in the library garage. We will validate up to 90 minutes. Um, machine is located at the main circulation desk. Please be mindful that we are recording this presentation and please silence your cell phones. And before we begin tonight's program, let us be reminded that we occupy the ancestral and traditional lands of the Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek nations. We would like to honor all the ancestral stewards of this land on which we meet today, from the elders who have gone before to the generations to come. It is now my pleasure to introduce Vanderbilt's Dr. Andre Churchwell, with us tonight in his role as Senior Advisor to the Chancellor on Inclusion and Community Outreach. Dr. Churchwell. Thank you, Rebecca. I want to thank you all for attending. This is our second History of Nashville Minority Community panel. This is our second panel, and it's called Then and Now, looking at the history of our minority communities from their inception to the current times. We're coming off a lively and informative first panel on part one, the history of Black North Nashville and Pearl High School. We're extremely excited to hold this panel on the history of the Nashville Latinx and Hispanic community. Of all of our minority communities, our Latinx and Hispanic community is growing the fastest. And you know, based on the data, based on where you get your data and what time you received it, you may be behind. Uh, Yuri's uh, data set from his uh, video clip says it's 14%. Well, my data said it was, four, it was 10% maybe five years ago. So we're rising above 15%. And certainly by the next five years, we may be 20% of the population, so that's very impressive. And it's one of the things we you hear about in terms of the Nashville growth of, of our, our Latino community here. 
To assist me in moderating this discussion is Yuri Kunza, President and CEO, National Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, a true Renaissance man, I kind of know about those things, a graduate of Watkins College of Art and Design, and with his hands in, in the print and visual media. Yuri's founder of the publication La Tosia, the Spanish language paper here in Nashville, and a very powerful voice for Nashville's growing Latino community, as is Yuri, a very important political and powerful voice. Yuri, please share your thoughts about this important and historic panel, if you wouldn't, wouldn't mind. Thank you. Well, hello everybody, good afternoon. Buenas tardes a todos, bienvenidos a los que están aquí, que tenemos una, una diversa audiencia este, este día, una, unos panelistas eh, excelentes en, de diferentes partes de esta comunidad que um, me tiene como su vecino ya, mm, yo creo que 30 años. Um, so, I've been a neighbor here since 1992, so I think that's 30 years. Um, more than half of my life, I lived in Nashville. So this is my home. To me, this is what I have my friends. Um, I think the closest people I know in my, in my short history, I think I want to consider that short history. My name is Yuri Kunza. I'm president and CEO of the Nashville Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, founded in the year 2000, is the oldest, longest running Hispanic business association in Tennessee. Uh, I have the pleasure to be joined by all of you. Uh, I said that in Spanish, friends and members of our community. This is, this is all for us. This is our home. This is where we live and we need to be um, building bridges, uh, learning about those who live around us, taking the time not to learn from things that you just watch on TV, but get to know your neighbor. I think that's very important. And be serious, Dr. Churchwell. Thank you for the invitation to be part of the effort. We're very honored and proud to have such distinguished professionals here who are gonna speak about um, this journey, right? Uh, then and now. So we look forward to learning more. Uh, I'm gonna learn today, I'm sure. The population in Nashville, like Dr. Churchill said, is estimated at 14%, but who knows? It may be more than that. It may be just 20% now. It, we are lacking uh, data, uh, hard data, numbers. Um, we attempt to survey our community locally in different ways, but still it's a work in progress. So we hope to better contribute to the understanding of our Hispanic community by continuing the work we do. With that, I think I'm gonna uh, give back the microphone to Dr. Churchwell. Thank you. One of the more pleasurable aspects of this job I have, the chancellor has asked me to perform, is to engage the Nashville community, our minority communities. And there's nothing like a, a native son of, like myself, a unicorn, I'm missing my horn here, but a unicorn <laughs> born and raised here to see this, the growth of this city and the vibrancy of the city change and, and evolve. It's just been phenomenal. And our Latino community has been a major force in that. Uh, what I would like to do now is ask uh, Avara Abali Morel from the Department of Animal Department of Spanish and Portuguese to offer us some salient information on the terms Latinx, Latino, and Hispanic. As you know, uh, we use these terms interchangeably, and that may not be uh, the actual appropriate use. So uh, I'll ask Avara to come up and share some thoughts with us. Thank you. Language is a living organism that undergoes constant transformation. It can serve as a tool for inclusion or exclusion, often reflecting concrete realities. Language is both communal and dynamic. Adopting new labels and neglecting previous ones should not be done without purpose, especially when considering the lives and histories of individuals. Language is deeply intertwined with politics of representation. One significant issue with using the term Hispanic to describe individuals of Latin American origin is that it doesn't include Brazil. 
Despite being the largest country in Latin America, Brazil doesn't fit this category due to its Portuguese-speaking nature. Hispanic primarily encompasses Spanish-speaking countries, including Spain, explicitly excluding indigenous and Afro-descendant communities. Therefore, Latin American is a more precise term encompassing people from Mexico to Patagonia. It is important to clarify that, that some individuals mistakenly regard Latino, Latina, Latine, Latinx as a shorter form of Latin American. The term Latinx first emerged in the United States in 2004, aiming for gender neutrality, nonconformity, and inclusivity, particularly in response to the hypergender nature of the Spanish language. Beyond this linguistic aspect, Latinx provided much needed recognition to the LGBTQIA community, acknowledging their existence and identity. Latinx and Hispanic are context specific. Their use responds to the unique experiences of Latin American and Spanish immigrants and their descendants in the United States. While not everyone identifies themselves as Latinx for various reasons, using this term marks the start of a linguistic transformation. Critics often overlook that Latinx isn't exclusively for the LGBTQIA community. According to Claudia Milian, the X symbolizes diverse stories, origins, struggles, and strengths expanding the term's scope. The X symbolizes hybridity and porosity, showcasing the blend of our heritage and the embracing of the United States. Identity categories often fall short of capturing the complexities of people's lived experiences. And we can ask ourselves, what is the proper term or expression to name an identity that it's personal and at the same time is collective? Every opinion is a vision loaded with personal history. Language is fluid. Today, we are not asking you to adopt a label for yourself. We are inviting you to join us in this discussion, recognizing the diverse tapestry of identities that enriches our understanding of the world we inhabit. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. At this point in the program, we're very grateful to have two preeminent scholars on the history of Latino and Hispanic people in Nashville, Tennessee. I would go far as to say we have the all-star team of historians who have actually spent a good chunk of their life here in Nashville studying the immigration of our Latino and Hispanic communities to Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Jamie Winders, associate professor. Okay, computer. There you go. Whoops. Back. Back one. All righty. There you go. Jamie Winders is associate professor of faculty affairs and professor of geography and environment at Syracuse University. Wrote an important book, author of, Na of Nashville in the New Millennium, Immigrant Settlement, Urban Transformation, and Social Belonging. With her is Dr. Andrea Flores. She's the Vartan Gregorian Assistant Professor of Education at Brown University, author of The Succeeders, How Immigrant Youth Are Transforming What It Means to Belong in America and to Belong in Nashville, for that matter. I want to thank them both for joining us today. Please. All righty. Um, so thanks very much. Let's try this. Point at the screen or back here. Point at you all. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. 
So um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this event. Uh, my career motto has always been, if you're the first, you don't have to be the best. Um, and that's very true tonight. So I'm happy to be going first because the remaining acts um, are very hard to follow. So it's a real honor um, to be part of this event tonight. So my job is to lay out some historical context around the growth of a Latinx community in Nashville. I started studying Latinx or Hispanic migration to Nashville in the early 2000s. And I had the benefit of being one of the first researchers to pay attention to this growing immigrant population. And I'll speak briefly about that research that I undertook in the 2000s and early 2010s. And I'm going to try to answer two basic questions of really when did Latinx folks start to come to Nashville? Why did they choose Nashville? And then I'm going to hand it over to Andrea, who's going to talk about what has changed in the kind of more recent years and where are we headed. So in the process, I want to tell a story about how Nashville became a popular destination for migrants and families from Mexico and Central America and parts of South America. But as you'll see tonight, the story that I'm going to tell is really only one of many about Nashville's Latinx community. And it's not the most important story. The stories you're going to hear from the folks who are the second half of the panel about their experiences of being an immigrant in Nashville are far more important. So there we go. So I want to start, let me swap this out. I want to start. Um, really in the early 1900s with a, a map from 1910 that I frequently show of what we would now call the first and second generation of immigrants, what in 1910 got called foreign stock. And as you'll see here, if we look at this map, um, southern states, including Tennessee, are really blank spaces on this map. They did not have a notable immigrant population. And this pattern of the absence of an immigrant presence in southern states would remain until um, the late 1990s when we began to see a new pattern. So what you're looking at here is a map of percent change or population growth of a Hispanic population and a foreign-born Mexican um, population across southern states from 1990 to 2000s. And the numbers are pretty impressive, and they're even more impressive in Nashville, which in the same time period saw just over a 450 percent increase in the Hispanic population. And one of the things we heard a lot in the early 2000s is this sense that a Latinx population kind of grew overnight um, in Nashville. Now, just so you don't think it's only a, an urban trend, we see the same pattern in rural parts of the South. So Dalton, Georgia, um, carpet capital of the, of the world, by 2010 was about 50% Hispanic. Mayfield, Kentucky, which is the hometown to a world-famous geographer who teaches at Syracuse, you may have heard of. Uh, so, so my hometown was 25% Hispanic by, by 2010. Now, if we focus in on Nashville, much of the growth of a Latinx population really took place in the southeastern quadrant of the city, around those black lines of neighborhoods like Woodbine, Flat Rock, pushing out into Antioch. And a number of factors really drove this migration. So obviously the availability of jobs in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a growth of a service economy in Nashville at the same time that there was a booming construction economy in the counties around Nashville. That played a factor. Lower cost of living in a place like Nashville relative to Los Angeles, the ability to be able to purchase a home here in a way you couldn't in California or Texas. Um, the impacts of the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act that regularized the status of over 2 million Mexicans. Um, in the rural south, the growth of meat processing plants. Um, and then we can't overlook push factors. So there's a lot of anti-immigrant legislation in California in the 1990s. It's pushing um, Latinx families out of California, out of Texas, um, as well as push factors coming from various parts of Latin America. Now, if we zoom into, I'm a geographer. If I don't show a lot of maps, I'll take my card away. Um, so if we zoom into southeast Nashville, you can see that by 2010, several census districts were more than one third Hispanic or Latinx. And multiple neighborhoods had not only growing, but very large Latinx populations. But one of the things to keep in mind is that even within those neighborhoods, there was often distance between immigrants and long-term residents, what was described to me by a Uruguayan couple in 2003 as um, Nashville has multiculturalism and multicultural people, and then there are Americans. Now, <laughs> I'm 
Not surprisingly, the rapid growth of a Latinx community in a part of the country that until the late 1990s had no experience with the growing immigrant population created situations where things sometimes got lost in translation. So the top map is one, uh, photo is one of my favorites from Aberdeen, North Carolina of a Mexican restaurant advertising South tasting food. Um, but some of those, those difficulties around translation were more substantive. So what you're looking at at the bottom um, were billboards that we saw across Nashville in the early 2000s, around 2006, when anti-immigrant sentiment really started to grow. And the campaign tapped into uh, a campaign from the Midwest of the idea of embracing the immigrant you once were. How do you make long-term residents understand the lived realities of, of immigrants? When we think about what would a billboard like this mean in historically black neighborhoods in Nashville where the migration history is the Middle Passage, not that moment in the early 1900s that we often think about for immigrant communities that populated places um, like the Midwest. Now, this question of how do you welcome a new and growing and diverse immigrant community while also supporting long-standing communities also face local neighborhoods. So in places like Flat Rock and Woodbine, community organizations and neighborhood organizations really sought ways to celebrate both the old and the new. Um, and as one long-term resident put it to me about her neighborhood, it had 45 different nationalities represented and a rich history of people who've lived there for years and are proud of that history. So we need to celebrate that history and the diversity that we have. And that was really what na national neighborhoods were, were trying to navigate um, in, the early, in the early 2000s and 2010. But I want to end this, pre this part of the discussion with an example of how in the late 2000s, young Latinx children tried to make sense of that same relationship between that history and the diversity we have. And so here we have a teacher um, talking about, we were talking about Martin Luther King and how blacks and whites were treated so differently. And they, and here she's actually referring to Kurdish children in her classroom, were like, well, which water fountain would I have been able to drink out of? My skin's white. And it was kind of hard to answer because they weren't here then. They were, they kept saying, my skin's the same color as yours. Would I be able to drink out of the good water fountain? And I said, well, what did you tell them? And she said, well, I don't know. We have a talk about it. You're actually a different culture. You have different beliefs, but that's okay. You might have had to drink out of that other one. And I always tell them, of course, it was wrong, blah, blah, blah. Um, this story came up over and over with teachers of Latinx children seeing pictures of Martin Luther King Jr. marching and saying, where are the Mexican kids? And teachers having to explain that this moment of a Jim Crow South did not have a Latinx population, but it impacts their lives. And so not only were teachers trying to make sense of an, a multilingual, a multicultural, a multiracial classroom, students were trying to make sense of how they fit in the history that had so profoundly shaped this place. So this lingering question is an ideal place to hand it over to Andrea, who's going to dive deeper um, into what happened to those children that I encountered in the early 2000s. To start by saying uh, thank you for having me here. And I did my research in Nashville, Tennessee here in the uh, kind of right after Jamie left. Uh, and I did the majority of my field work in 2012 and 2013, uh, working with young people. And it was really an honor and a privilege to get to learn their stories and, and, and share in that moment in their lives. And so uh, Jamie has to show maps. I'm an anthropologist. I got to quote people or they'll take my card away. And this was a young woman I worked with and I asked her, uh, she was born in Nashville, what did you know about why your parents came here? What was it like when they first came here? And she said, at this time it is welcoming. My parents say it wasn't very nice when they got here in the 90s, that there, since there weren't a lot of them, they were looked at differently. But as, as Jamie nicely teed me up, she said, since our schools are so diverse now, it's not something strange. And there's more stores, Mexican stores, and Spanish is spoken a lot more. It's not something strange. So for this young woman, she described that her parents had a very difficult time settling in Nashville, uh, but now she, coming of age in the, in the mid-2000s, didn't have that same issue. So there was the historical memory, and then there was also kind of a, a broader uh, national memory. This young, one young man, when I asked him, has Nashville been a welcoming place for Latinx folks and, and Latin Americans? 
his response was, I mean, it's not Arizona, referring to in, 2000, in the 2010, or a little bit before then, sorry, uh, 2007, there was SB 1070 that was kind of colloquially known as the show me your papers law, where uh, folks were being stopped by law enforcement just on the assumption that they might be undocumented. And it was the, the, the harshest law at the time that allowed kind of municipal enforcement. So the young people that I was working with were creating kind of mental maps based on their family histories, family experiences, but also thinking about what does it mean to be Latinx in a broader context of the United States, but also in the hyper-local spaces of my school. Since I'm not a geographer, I get to show funny maps. Um, <laughs> this map was passed around to me by actually some of the young people I worked with, and Jamie showed that uh, this kind of southeastern corridor, and you can see that you know it's labeled here Southern pride, Mexico, misspelled Guatemala, uh, Kurdish pride, right? Which kind of points to the, the local sense making that was happening, that this is where immigrants live and this is where they've, in, they've encountered uh, white Nashville, right? And so um, I think what this also shows is the sense people were making of this for their own lives and understanding a changing city. So part of that was uh, one young man that I was working with, he shared with me uh, Guatemalan uh, descent, which is why I'm so upset that Guatemala was misspelled in that map. Uh, he was making pinatas at an event that I was at and he made his pinata blue and white. He said, you know, I'm making it that because everyone thinks we're Mexican, right? The colors of the Guatemalan flag are blue and white. And I, I bring that up to say that when we think about the Latinx population, Mexicans certainly have been the largest demographic here in, in Tennessee, but it's not the, uh, the only population. So uh, the, as you see in the picture on the far right there, that was from the opening of the uh, Salvadoran consulate here. And uh, the consulate estimates there are about 18,000 Salvadorans in the area. Guatemala will be opening a, pro uh, a new uh, consulate that they announced that last May. So it's a, and they estimate there's about 72,000 Guatemalans in the, in the region. So it's a very, as we'll see from our esteemed panelists here, it's, it's a very diverse group of folks coming from m many of the countries of Latin America. So to give you a sense, as Jamie mentioned, things were kind of a little bit on, the, on, on a shifting ground in the early, two, early 2000s. The first thing I wanna point out here is 287G which was, as many of you I'm sure remember or know, was a, a, a partnership between federal authorities and local law enforcement enabled by uh, an immigration law that allowed local enforcement to uh, kind of handle immigration in the context of municipal stops. And so uh, kind of like show me your papers, what happened was is that it, we saw a lot of racial targeting of the Latino population being pulled over for a broken taillight, turning into a turn lane too soon. A lot of folks were being stopped for driving without a license, which if we look at the li licensure as a state uh, matter, and at one point Tennessee allowed undocumented folks to get licenses, then disallowed, then had a certificate for licensure, then took that out. So folks wanted to comply with the rules of the road, but weren't given the opportunity. So people were being deported for minor offenses. And colleagues that have worked in that area have pointed out that characteristics about language use, skin color, uh, country of origin were gaining salience in arrest reports prior to reports of a similar nature to 287G. One of the most famous cases of this that many of you I'm sure remember was the case of Juana Villegas who was pulled over in the Berry Hill area for driving without a license. She was held while she was heavily pregnant, gave birth while shackled, and uh, it was a, a kind of large uh, story locally in Nashville kind of bringing to light the, the trouble of 287G and how uh, local Im immigrant detention was really a, an inhumane uh, uh, situation. She received a U visa, which is given to victims of crimes, and that was the crime from the city that had uh, done this to her and to also obviously the um, being held. So there was a kind of, this was kind of all in the background and as places like Flat Rock and Woodbine were kind of changing, there was, as Melissa, the, the student I call Melissa noted, Spanish was being spoken more, right? And so we had the English only movement, again, 
I'm preaching to the choir here, folks in Nashville, so you probably all know this history, but uh, it was to make all city services offered only in English. So if your pipe burst and you tried to call Metro services and you didn't speak English, if you spoke Kurdish or Spanish, who would, how could you tell that to someone, right? It ultimately, due to the, the work of many local activists and community members, through a plebiscite, didn't pass. And when I talk to local activists and community members, they see that as a real turning point to a more welcoming Nashville, maybe getting the language uh, away from the immigrant you once were to looking at the community as it is now, and how do we create a place that is responsive to who lives here. And uh, so uh, going from there, oops, going from there in English only, uh, we have in 2011 the first Latinx uh, counselor elected to uh, Metro City, Fabian Bendier. And uh, in 2017, I wanna bring this up point, as, as Jamie mentioned, I worked with young people, and this was a real moment where we saw the political and social power of these young people. In, uh, as we all know, DACA has come under Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which allowed uh, un undocumented youth who fit several different criteria to access a work permit and uh, a stay of deportation. There was a large suit that ultimately kind of goes up to the Supreme Court from various states saying, let's end DACA, it's an unlawful program. 10 states were part of that initial suit, including Tennessee. Many young people were very active here in organizing and to, to put pressure on, uh, on the Attorney General. And in 2017, um, Herbert H. Slattery cited the human element as the reason that he pulled uh, Tennessee out of the suit. And I just wanna point that out because here we see those young people like Melissa who were born here or not born here, but brought here as a young person, feeling empowered to do that work to make their city and their, this country their home. And I bring that up to point to the, the most recently elected um, city councilman Sandra Sepulveda, who came here at age five and now is a council member just recently re-elected to kind of point to that change in people power. The most recent uh, kind of benefit here was uh, the workforce expansion bill. And I bring that up because this provided licensure for folks with statuses like DACA and T visas and U visas that uh, you're kind of in an in-between space to get a license to become a hairstylist, a real estate agent, because your status doesn't match the forms. And so, again, it was the work of young activists here to say, let's make sure that these young people can get the jobs in the things that they wanna do. And that's you know, uh, really a step ahead of some other states that are seen as more progressive that don't have these laws. So we see the young people here really pushing the nation forward as well. And I bring that up to kind of point to some of these young leaders uh, who, who are on the news, in community organizing, and uh, important for my research, which is focused on schools, in the classrooms, and working uh, around the classrooms and in nonprofit sectors, the nonprofit sector, excuse me, to feel that school that they once were wondering, can I drink out of this water fountain, and making sure it continues to be a welcoming place for them and coming back to those places to ensure it for future generations. And so I bring that up because as, as Jamie's work certainly beautifully showed, you say you're first, you didn't have to be best, but you're, you're awesome. So schools are these sites where we first see that change happening. It's where folks come to interact across cultures. And so um, this is Melissa again, kind of pointing to schools as a, as a right, she says there, um, our schools are so diverse now, right? This is the, the, the place where this is happening. It's not something strange. So I just wanna bring that up is that this is a key place where we see uh, emerging leadership and also a bellwether of how welcoming a, a place is. And so looking at the educational sector, early on there's a mismatch of kind of uh, services offering for multilingual learners and others. But, and we see persistent inequalities in K through 12 uh, outcomes, as I'll point to as a moment, and structural obstacles to college access, including a lack of financial aid for undocumented students. But through the efforts of persistent students, families, and educators, we've made strides there. Uh, and again, this is a, 
to kind of look at, if we look at the grad rate in the early 2000s and 2003, we see it's 43% per, per Latinx students versus 64% uh, for white students. In 2013, it had risen to 72%, right? And we see, when we look at this across the national uh, data, it's, it's similarly skewed, but Tennessee's kind of lagging behind. Uh, however, I will point out, uh, this was once leveled at Tennessee's own Al Gore, but we can see maybe there's some fuzzy math here where we're going from 61% and to 80% the next year. Not sure quite how that happened, but what we do know is MLL students and children who had aged, aged out were being forced out of public schools to bring those numbers up. Um, as I mentioned, this wasn't a smooth transition, but we did get some uh, more parity. But if we look now, in the, some of that has slid back. So uh, multilingual learners are, are down to 64%. And here, I think it's in the low 70s for the Latino population. Part of that is from the pandemic, right? So we see learning loss in these communities where we have struggle with access to online school, a quiet place to work, managing your siblings' education as you try to get your own. So there's still work to be done, um, but we certainly, especially with the leadership of these young people, we can feel hopeful. Uh, and certainly, uh, one young man talked about uh, the problems of reception would be cured if folks went to their high school and saw that they really do try to work with everybody. So if we think about social and economic change, I'll leave the kind of our, our wonderful later panelists to talk about uh, business in, in Nashville. But the story of, of the Latinx community is concurrent with the story of a more diverse Nashville generally with immigrants from across the global south. Um, obviously this, this means more cultural and linguistic diversity, more food diversity. And I would like to point out that even as, as uh, uh, recent as last week, right, Metro Nashville Public Schools announced that it will be diversifying its food offerings. And I bring that up to say we think about food and language sometimes as, as softer indicators, right? But as Elvira mentioned, right, these are how do, you, how do you recognize an identity? And being able to eat the food that you know and love in school shows you that that's part of your home now. And so uh, uh, we also see rates of home... Um, growing home ownership, and in, in uh, Tennessee, about 45% uh, of Latinx folks are homeowners. They're younger than their uh, uh, non-Latinx counterparts, and part of that is, again, this, these things like DACA have enabled folks to be able to get loans and uh, build lives for their families without the fear of, of, am I going to be able to make a life here? Do -do. So where are we going as we talk to our panelists about their lived experience? We see an increased demographic presence and one that is diverse across Latin American uh, countries and language groups. We see growing economic power and growing business. And I would also like to point out that the Latinx community has been central to the economic growth of Nashville as a city. Uh, all those construction uh, cranes that we see out there, all of the new shiny buildings had to be built by someone. And many times those folks were Latinx. And certainly we see a lot of folks working in the service industry to make sure all those tourists keep stumbling down Broadway, right? Someone has to take care of them. Uh, also the growing political power in, in Fabian Benier and, and Sandra Sepulveda point out that this is a community that whose voices are going to be heard. And I would just say that um, events like tonight also show the growing civic presence of the Latinx community. And with that, I just say thank you to all of you for coming tonight, and thank you to, to everyone who's going to be speaking about their experience and sharing that with us. Uh, can you get uh, the mic for uh, Professor uh, Eddie Rios, if I can bring us there? Well, great. We have some time, so we'll uh, open up for a few questions here. We'll start with, uh, we have... Uh, we have both a geographer, funny who does maps, we have an anthropologist, we actually have a historian here. We actually have any right Rios, who's a doctor at Vanderbilt. He's a Mellon Foundation Chair in the Humanities, professor of history. And uh, I'd like to hear any comments you might have and the questions to pose to our panelists here. 
Uh, thank you very much, Andre. Thank you to the excellent panelists, Elvira, and thank you all to the publico, to the public, the audience that's here tonight. So I think, you know, you heard from a geographer and anthropologist who, you know, flashed their, like, maps and interviews. So for a historian, what I always want to do is take you back to the Stone Age. Like, let's start at the very beginning and let's walk way up. And for me, what is really interesting about this work is the way it showcases big things. So for example, if you read Jamie's book, you'll see these things about how neighborhoods evolve, how communities connect to each other, sometimes in tension, sometimes in cooperation, and then the smaller intimate things as well. So if you look in Andrea's book, you'll read these things about individual students asking questions and learning, and learning about each other and learning about who they are. So it's this ability to go back and forth between sort of big picture and, and intimate and close. And I think for a historian, what we want to do is pull way back and then try to knit together the economic processes. So what are the longer term things that say bring Latino migrants or Latinx people to this part of the United States? Is it construction jobs? Is it maybe a chicken plant? Is it nursery jobs near Cookville? So you see these ways that you can learn about Nashville and then start to connect it to these other processes, flows, and patterns over longer periods. What are the connections to groups in Texas, in California, and of course, what are the histories of Latin America? And this is something I always want to get people. You really ought to understand Guatemala if you want to understand Guatemaltecos in Nashville. And so there's always this you know, for myself, I always want to preach, shall we say, this idea that you've got to go back, you've got to go to, you got to, go to little towns in Mexico to understand the patterns. You've got to go to little places in Honduras, in El Salvador, all of these towns, and then walk up with the people you're interested in into the schools they're in, the elementary schools, into the programs of college access, and then, of course, pull out the maps. Where do people live? Who do they live next to? Where do they shop? and how do they connect to each other. But thank you all for bringing it up and painting that big picture. Thanks, Andy. You guys, uh, Andrea, Jamie, you want to respond? Just comment. Sure, so I think, um, thank you for those comments. You know, one of the, for folks who study migration, it's always like, why don't you study Los Angeles, or Chicago's really important, or why don't you study New York? And to me, what you just laid out really drives home why, if you want to understand the politics of migration, the politics of social belonging, any of these sorts of things, you have to start in a place like Nashville, where those threads are really clear, where you can follow them, and where you can think um, about the city and the smaller towns and the economic and the political. And so I think there's real, from my perspective as a scholar, there's so much value um, in thinking deeply about the experiences of immigrants, not just in the, the big gateway cities, but in, but in places like Nashville. I would just add that, you know, we we're all part of a historical moment, but we experience it individually, right? And so I think that it's, it's really the value of, of a, uh, kind of broad study into a field like migration through history, through geography, through anthropology, through sociology, I'll even let the economists in. But to say that, to see how that shapes our everyday experiences as a person, right? We're, we're the product of these broader socio-historical and economic forces, but that we can't lose the sight of that we all experience that individually. And that the voices of the panelists that we'll, we'll hear next and the people that we've worked with really shed light on how those things are felt, how it feels to be, as Du Bois talked about, how does it feel to be constructed as a problem, and how do you change people's minds about who you are? Any questions from the audience? We've got time for maybe one or two. Please, hang on. Hello, I was gonna ask, uh, how has the growth? My name is Cleaver Reese. Um, hello. <laughs> So I was going to ask, how has the growth of the Latinx community affected other communities, both in a positive and negative way, um, socially and economically? So I think that uh, some of the things are the, the perception of resource scarcity, right? And so you create 
artificial wedges between minoritized communities that say, hey, if you're getting this, is it coming from us, right? And so there's a question of how do you build coalitions across folks that may, op may operate in the same socioeconomic strata, have the same issues that they're facing. And so I think that there's been challenges around that in certainly in the educational sector and other ones as well. But I also think that when we look at the, the quotations from the students about schools, we've also seen there where recent migrant families from different parts of the world have come together and seen each other as allies as well, right? So it's a question of how do local communities start to see each other and how can they see past some of the polarizing rhetoric that we see around municipal, well, less municipal politics, but maybe state politics in Tennessee and national politics. So I think it's looking at those creative bridge work that's being done by a lot of young activists and, and uh, community members. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Excellent question. You know, as uh, we have, once again, a historian, we have the geographers, we have the anthropologists, well, the physician will now step in. <laughs> Uh, and, and make just a general comment about health equity. And health equity, unfortunately, uh, is uh, still an issue for all minoritized communities in Nashville, whether they be uh, Latino, Hispanic, African American, Kurdish, or the like. And they're all tied around to issues of where we live and our access to highly resourced schools, which is an issue, and, and they talk about, our great uh, writers here talk about this in their books. Uh, the under-resourced uh, under nature of some of our schools that kids are attending uh, compared to other parts of the city, particularly in West Nashville. And, but also the lack of, uh, you know, you have food deserts or a lack of uh, markets that have uh, brain-rich food, like green, green vegetables and, and, and uh, fresh meats. Uh, and then you have the issue of crime and how it influences your inability to go out and work out and run and, and, and stay in shape. So there are a whole host of factors uh, that, uh, that have social implications on, on the success of all our minority communities, and certainly uh, these are things that our politicians and our leaders are all addressing. Uh, but uh, I think it's important to point out there's some commonalities that we all face. Uh, I'd like to thank you all so much. Another hand, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie and Andrea. And, and they are connected. You heard about uh, one of them is from Mayfield. I think that's uh, Andrea. And no, that, that's Jamie. And then uh, there you go. I see, I got it wrong. So that's my physician. You're the geographer. I got it. The map is all messed up. And, but then we have Andrea is connected by our family members who are here in the Nashville area. So it is about family, right? And so connecting with family is really important for all of us uh, in our communities. You know, before we move to our community leaders, and I'll turn the microphone on to Yuri here, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people who are in the audience. You know, my dad, uh, Robert Churchwell, who was acknowledged in the Banner Room, in the Civil Rights Room here, is uh, one of the great writers, uh, Af African-American writers, his, uh, journalist here in Nashville, the first African-American to write on a newspaper in the Southeast right after World War II, came home to Fisk and got an English degree and wrote for the Nashville Banner for many years. But he always would tell us around the dinner table that success of race relations in Nashville or any southern city is not tied to just the struggle of those in the minority communities trying to push their way up, but it's also for those who sit in positions of power, influence, and resources to recognize that there is social justice to be done. And we have in our audience uh, Dr. Michael Spalding, my great friend. Michael, please stand. Michael is a retired urologist who's founder and director of the Equal Chance for Education Foundation, and for a number of reasons, Mike, uh, t 10 years ago, 10 years ago began funding the college education of DACA students here in Nashville. At this point, out of his, most out of his own pocket, so I'll drive you home tonight, Mike. Uh, uh, these kids are finishing Metro Public School with high academic achievement, but because they are DACA, they can't get federal funding. Mike has funded 567 students so far for college education for this foundation. I want us to really acknowledge it. So we all have something to contribute when it comes to social justice and moral justice in this country, in this city. So, and we have another person we want to acknowledge. We had a spectacular Latin jazz group here playing. Yuri, you want to talk about who that, who the group was and, and acknowledge their leader? Yes, uh, so if you, a couple of things. I'm going to acknowledge also a few people that are here now. Um, so you had food before this event, the reception, catered by a local small business, member of our network, Sulema's Kitchen. 
I hope you enjoy that. And we have this wonderful music by uh, the one and only uh, Rafael Vasquez. Please stand. Congratulations. He's the founder of San Rafael Band. Very talented, award-winning musician who has been a, a resident here of our area for, for many decades as well. Also, the board chair of our National Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Claudia Suazo, is here with her husband. Please stand. And two board members from our NACC Foundation here are Charlene Helmut and Walter Perry. Please raise your hand. Right. And all of you are very important and very distinguished, and I count on you to share the information you gather today and try to make a better city for all. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. We're at the part of the program now, we're moving in the second half, uh, and we, uh, as Jamie and Andrea talked about the uh, legacy of the Latin immigration uh, uh, into Nashville and how it has changed the culture of the city, we actually have people here from, that are community leaders who have walked the walk, talked the talk, and lived that particular history, and we're really excited to have them here. Many, and if you have the program, there's some short bios on, on the back that actually give you a little more information about each one. But briefly, we have Manuel Corvez and Ophelia Vasquez. Could you raise your hand there, please? The great Manuel. Uh, you know, Manuel's design, the, the rhinestone suits of uh, Loretta Lynn and uh, Marty, uh, Marty Stewart and Dwight Yoakam and Gene Autry, my great hero. And he designed Get this, those slick mohair suits that uh, the Rat Pack wore when he was working in Los Angeles with Cy DeVore. Uh, my tailor from England flew to Nashville, not just to see me, but to come visit Manuel. He knew Manuel and their history. Amazing. Thank you, Manuel. <laughs> we have Lorraine Segovia Paz, executive director. Raise your hand there, Lorraine. Where you? There you are. Uh, the executive director of the Nashville Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation. She's an entrepreneur, she's a force of nature, she's involved in multiple not-for-profit organizations and on leadership boards of a number of key uh, institutions and organizations here in Nashville. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> uh, Mario Ramos, U.S. immigration attorney, that kind of says it all, you know. <laughs> Degrees from London, UT, I can't list them all here, Mario, I'm sorry. It would take all the time. But his amazing work for DACA students and those that are trying to get to Nashville has been amazing. He'll be able to share some of that. Thank you for coming. <laughs> then we have Jose Vera Gonzalez and Susie Vera, owner of Vera Art. Raise your hands there. Jose and Manuel are great examples that if you are an artist, you can actually be a work of art and create art. So look at what they're wearing here, amazing. And so, Jose, phenomenal work mm -hmm. that you'll see around Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, on the uh, doors and uh, surfaces of restaurants around town, the walls. You'll see his work in Cheekwood, just phenomenal artwork, and we're going to show a little bit of here in a minute here. Then we have Roxanne Velasquez, raise your hand there, owner <laughs> of Siente Mares Mexican Restaurant. Did I get it right? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. I practiced that all last night. And so we got, and so phenomenal, but also an entrepreneur too, and she'll be able to share some of her story. And then her son, Lalo Marino, the tallest man other than myself here, <laughs> owner of Lalo's is Auto Sales. So we're going to have Yuri to be able to, to go over and with the mic, and uh, we'll begin by listening to some of their stories. Yuri. Uh, you'll grab right there next to uh, all of our own. And then we have mics here, and I'll, I'll, I'll get those. We're going to listen to some short bios, and we hit, they're going to answer some questions for us here. As we're doing that, I'm going to show a couple of slides that show some of their artwork. None of this is their artwork, but this is not bad <laughs> stuff either. Here we go. So that's Manuel. That's in his atelier. Amazing rhinestone, silk, wool combinations there. There's a spectacular painting of Manuel with his great friend Loretta Lynn wearing one of his outfits there. And he, it hangs in his studio. And one of his jackets that he made for all, made jackets for all 50 states that was part of an exhibition at uh, the Frist Center about 10 years ago. Amazing exhibition. Amazing gifted artist there. 
Vera Art, Jose and his wife, do the very vibrant colors, uh, phenomenal pieces here. Vibrant, uh, matches the colors that we have on our stands here. Uh, just an exciting artist that's uh, growing in talent and, uh, and in able to distribute his work and show his work around this, this state as well as in Kentucky and, and northern Alabama and the like. So thank you all for being here. We're going to now move back and now, uh, Yuri, I'll let you take the mic and we'll leave it probably there. So you have the questions. Yeah, you want to ask about the bias. Oh, first of all, it's going to be short. It's going to be hard because <laughs> each one has a, a great history. They'll take much longer than that, but I'll start with Manuel. Just uh, introduce yourself, tell a little bit about your, your history. Um, yeah, briefly. Thank you. Well, I could be talking about me all night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we but know. You know what it is. Is let me make uh, just a little thing. Tell you the short story, so I don't make it too long for you. I I've been lucky enough to meet the most beautiful people in the world, especially those that are in the rich classes of the world that have taught me. I didn't know how much I I really needed to learn, but I'm telling you, every day, right now, after 90, I'm still learning. And I am just, I've been blessed with people, like the grandest designer in the world. You know, Edith Head taught me a lot of things. And I was really doing so well, making movies and doing whatever. You know, I'm not an actor, by the way, I make wardrobe. And what I do really is characters after reading the script of a movie. And it's how much and how deep you go into history. And you must really get into it to bring that character. So one of the good example was, I think Clint Eastwood was one of them. I had made a little series of uh, TV shows with him, and it was called Rohai. He was a young man, very, you know, and I, I just didn't want to make a gunslinger out of him. I wanted to make him a, a new kid, you know, like a new kid in town, and, you know, it's like shooting rabbits out there at the beginning of the movies. It, it always is, by the way. Anyway, that was one of the things, and then I get to make face-to-face uh, -face with the monster of Hollywood, you know, the big man. You know, I, he says, Manuel, I need to talk to you. We need to get these movies that are developing in Italy. We want to get rid of this guy and just get him out of here, do something. He's talking about one of the biggest uh, I think the directors in the world. And uh, this Italian man has his way, but only so far. He said, we gotta bring and keep our work in America. I said, that'll be so easy. Anyway, <laughs> so I contributed to that. See, just talking to people like that is what makes history in a person. I'm, other than that, I'm just a simple boy born 90 years ago in Qualcomán, Michoacán, Mexico. Ophelia. Ophelia Vasquez is next. Just tell us briefly about where you come from, how long you've been around, and why are you here? Yeah. Look at these outfits they're wearing. This is all Manuel's work. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, night, I guess. I'm Ophelia Vasquez. I'm from Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. I came here in 1998 for the first time. I was on vacation, and then I continue coming every year, and I just fall in love. In Nashville, I love the nature, and I came from a big city, the second largest in, in, in Mexico, so I was used to the, to the noise, to the cars, and the big city, but once, once I got here, I fell in love with the quiet, nice town that was in that time, so I just decided to stay. <laughs> what is your expertise? What is your expertise? 
my expertise. Well, um, I study in Mexico. I went to the Univa in Guadalajara, and I study administration. Very good. Gracias, Ophelia. Vamos a pasarle el mic a Mario. Mario tiene el mic. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Ophelia. Okay, um, well, see, my father was Colombian, and my mother was Colombian and, and Belgian, and my parents moved to Tennessee in 1962. So as a child growing up, I've seen quite a bit of growth here in the this sort of growth and transformation of the Latino community. I think we moved here into Nashville roughly around 1981. So you have seen, uh, had the opportunity to see the growth of the community. Now, I'm an immigration attorney. Um, you mentioned DACA. They did like 800 DACA cases at the beginning, like 10% of roughly the state total. Uh, we, it's, I've, I've, as an immigration attorney, we do lots of cases. That's what we do, lots and lots of cases. Just over and over, every day, produce cases, knock out cases, okay? but. What I've done in terms of my other work, because being an attorney allows me to be, to create things. The same way Manuel creates clothes, you create art. You create food and businesses, and of course, so the, in terms of the Deborah's for it's business people. I, as an attorney, have the, the opportunity to be a social player. I'll go back to the question that young man asked. He was a really good question. And the question was, how do we fit in this community, okay? I'll tell you a small story. My story is that in 19, uh, what was it, 2002, okay? The, I get a phone call, I get actually a visit from a guy named uh, Anthony, I can't remember his last name, but he was from the AFSA. He walks into my office, he said, Mario, can you help host the Freedom Workers Ride here in Nashville? And fortuitously, two days prior, Spring Miller showed up in my office and said, I need an intern, I want to do an internship, I'm a Harvard graduate. I said, okay, I'll take a Harvard graduate, why not? <laughs> and so I had nothing for her to do, I said, come back Monday. He shows up, she comes on Wednesday, he comes on a Friday, and I go, why are you picking me? He goes, well, nobody else wants to do it. And no one in the local unions want to do this because it's hosting immigrant workers, immigrant freedom ride. So I accept the, the challenge and uh, then I begin to research. And I started my research and there I read about, and I thought, no, wait, they're, they're using the same name as the freedom ride. Cause it's kind of, you know, like, wow, it's pretty unusual for that. And then I found out about James Lawson who was expelled from Vanderbilt. And then we're talking to my wife, Edie's, we're having dinner and I said, well, why don't we bring it back to Nashville? So I call him up and he answers the phone. He has a little church there in, in, in uh, Los Angeles. In and, and spring, she uses her credit card to buy the tickets, pay the hotel room. Then we got James Sigenthal to give us $5,000 to pay for it. <laughs> Had to get the money right. And then he comes here. We do an, an event here at the library. And we have a, a meeting here where he gives a, a talk before you have the, uh, the great civil rights room. And then we did a, a march down at the uh, Hall of Fame Museum, the park. But that's the role we play. We have the opportunity to be social actors and to help bring together uh, things that, that may not exist when we, when we can create things. Now, of course, he was well received by the city. It was dynamic, tremendous in terms of reception, and it really exploded and beyond what you could ever imagine. But that's part of the, one of the stories I'll tell you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. That's great. Gracias, Mario. <laughs> Roxanne Velasquez. Yes, Roxanne Velasquez. I was born in El Salvador but I moved to United States. I've been living in this country 33 years and um, running a Siete Mares Mexican restaurant by, bar and grill for 27 years. And um, I am happy to be in this country. Gracias. Thank you. <laughs> Lorraine Segovia Paz. Thank you. Um, Talking about indigenous communities in the Hispanic world, I will say Alinchisi. So Alinchisi, it's the Quechua language from Peru, from the indigenous communities in Peru. So you will respond Alinchisi back to me. Alinchisi. Alinchisi Kachun. Mamaikuna, Turaikuna, Nyanyaikuna. Noga Lorraine Segovia Pascani. Noga Josco Hatun Yaktapi Pagaritkani. Noga Hispanic Chamber of Com Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation Yankani Nisga. Uh, ¿Qué estoy diciendo en español? Es, eh, estoy diciendo que mi nombre es Lorraine Segovia Paz. Yo nací en la grandiosa ciudad del Cusco, Perú. Estoy aquí representando a la Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation y estoy muy orgullosa de estar aquí. And then for the ones that speak English. 
my third <laughs> language. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Good, uh, good evening, friends, uh, comrades, everyone that is present here. My name is Lorraine Segovia Paz. I am originally from Peru. I was born in the city of Cusco, and I'm sure you have heard of the Inca Empire. Sure? Yes. So then I am here representing the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation. I'm happy that we have heard all of this information for these professors because I want you to know that when we talk about the Hispanic community, we are also including the indigenous community. And many of us has blood, indigenous blood in us. So thank you. Hello everybody, uh, I'm Eduardo, but you can call me Lalo. Uh, I'm a Nashville native, born and raised. My mother's Salvadoran, my father's Mexican. Uh, since I was six, I've been growing up in the family business, well, multiple businesses. And I used to go to school, but I dropped out because I felt um, overwhelmed with all the business, but, or not overwhelmed, but that I needed to focus more on helping my family out, you know? And now it is my turn to start my own legacy in my own name with Lalo's Auto Sales. So, and I'm very happy to be here and very blessed to still be here today. Thank you. Hola a todos. Mi nombre es Susi Vera. Hello, everybody. My name is Susi Vera. I was born in Michoacán, Mexico. I came to this country when I was about eight years old. Actually, I arrived in Chicago, so when you guys mentioned Chicago, and it was in the 19, 1990. So yeah, it was a big challenge for me coming to this country with not knowing the language, uh, trying to fit in, it was kind of complicated. But throughout the years, um, I have lived in many uh, states. I have lived in Texas, I have lived in Georgia, so when you mentioned Dalton, I know Dalton as well. <laughs> I've been all over. Um, a bit, I'm HR, I did a staffing for um, 10 years, property management, 10 years, and then I did a 360 and met this man, <laughs> marry him, and I do jewelry now. So I'm a jewelry making, that's, that's one of the things that I have learned and love to do. Thank you guys, and gracias a todos. Thank you. Me voy a dirigir esta noche en español en honor a nuestro mes que viene, celebrando el mes de la herencia hispana del 15 de septiembre al 15 de octubre. ¡Viva el español! <risa> Mi nombre es José Vera González, nací en el pueblo de Pastor Ortiz, Michoacán, un estado que le llaman el alma de México. Soy pintor y artista visual, donde me tocó la suerte de tener en la vida unos padres extraordinarios, Mi padre está en el cielo, pero lo llevo conmigo en mi corazón porque él me inculcó las artes, las artes de las que llevo con todo el corazón en esta ciudad. Y realizo este, con mucho amor para todos ustedes y nuestros clientes. Nos dedicamos a hacer murales. Estoy muy feliz de estar aquí como panelista, como invitado. Y es un honor para mí el estar hablando mi lengua del que me siento orgulloso y de mi país México. Este, también quiero agradecer este, la invitación a la Cámara de Comercio, a Yuri, a Lorraine, que siempre hacen un arduo trabajo para que nosotros los hispanos este, también tengamos una inclusión aquí, que es bien importante, ya que nuestra ciudad está generando una infraestructura y tecnología para vivir una vida mejor. Tenemos un planeta en riesgo y tenemos que luchar por él. ¡Viva la vida! Susie, you want to give us a short... Uh... Summary. Thank you. Who understand that? <laughs> sí, I understand. Well, basically, he says he's from uh, Pastor Ortiz, Michoacán, El Alma de México, that means the soul of Mexico. And he was, um, he feels very proud. He's from a father and a mother from Mexico. His parents, they both were artists. So that's where he gets his art. He was basically born an artist. And this is what I say. Um, he started painting basically since he was able to hold a brush. So when he started crawling, if he could hold a brush, he started painting. Um, he feels very happy to be here. He wants to speak his, of course, origin language, which is Spanish because he's very proud. He's, um, ¿qué más era? Sí. <laughs> what else was it? <laughs> 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 See, 
and I took notes, right? So that way, and I, I'm like, okay, you're not going to do me this to me again. He feels, lengua, he, feels, he feels very proud to speak the language. He feels very proud to speak He feels very proud to come from a country which is very proud of um, arts. Es bien simple. Viva la vida, porque cada vida es importante en este planeta. Viva la vida. I think everybody understands that. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Great, great. We have a couple of questions right, uh, that, that we've uh, put together. You know, you've seen Nashville change. What changes have you seen since you've been here? You've been here a long time. The good things that have happened, Manuel, can you comment about what you've, since you've been here? Well, the microphone. Let me tell you, when you arrived in Nashville, like I did, Actually, I, ha I had come many times to Nashville. But one day, something wasn't working in California. And then my wife, a lady called Susan Cabbage, told me this, is, this LA is becoming totally uncomfortable to live. I said, where shall we go? She said, you took me to Nashville once, and I would love to go to Nashville. <laughs> and here I am, Nashville. <laughs> I mean, dressing, I mean, everybody with a guitar or without a guitar, I don't care, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, after all, I've been dressing dollies, and she was in training bra, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. That's great. What have you guys seen? You know, you came during that early time of immigration uh, where there were r more challenges, I'm sure, uh, than, like you, than you see now. Can you comment about that, Ophelia? Well, like Susie mentioned, you know, it was very challenging when I first got here, uh, I was talking with, my, with our friend, and uh, we were saying that when I got here, we were just a few women, 98 Spanish women. We were probably one woman for 20 or 30, uh, 30 Latins. So it was like 30 guys coming to you to invite you, and it was like, no, no, I don't do that. So, uh, and the other thing was, um, it was a little more uh, racist. Now it's changing. We were like strangers. And sometimes I hear people saying about us like we were uh, foreigners, but uh, um, like, cuando vienes de otro planeta. Well, uh, not out of this world, but uh, aliens. Aliens. They refer us as right. aliens. aliens, and for right. me that word was like, I'm not an ET, you know, <laughs> it's like, right. how can I be an alien? And uh, I came from a big city, so for me it was, I had to adjust to the small city, as I mentioned, but then I got used to it and I won't change it. And also it's growing, uh, it's growing so fast, now I feel like uh, Nashville is, full of uh, these buildings, like it's getting like a big monster city, not in the bad way, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> don't take it wrong, not in the bad way, but it's getting so huge that is sometimes for me, now that I'm used to the quietness of outside of the city, coming in the city with all this traffic that I wasn't used to that, that was the main reason I decided to stay here because we have a lot of traffic in Guadalajara and here is like, oh my gosh, this is nice. I can drive and I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so uh, that's a, that was another thing for me to, to uh, reason for me to stay. So I, I have seen Nashville growing and a lot of people, not only me, now we have people from all over the world here in Nashville. So I don't feel, I don't feel like I'm an alien anymore. I feel like I'm now part of the city and part of the community. Yay. Great. Mario, question. So you go to UT, get your bachelor's. See, I, I read your resume. You didn't know that. Uh, got your bachelor's. You go to London, get advanced degrees. You get a law degree. But you have to start a business. And that's a long, in 1980 is a long time ago. What did you see then? What did you face? And what does it feel like now for people who start businesses? OK. Um, of course, I'm an attorney, and when I came to Nashville, um, my brother Fred, who was an attorney also, uh, he had an office, and I studied immigration law. We went to law school, and uh, so I began doing immigration law at the very beginning. And I thought Fred had immigration law, and during the uh, at that point, '86, the immig immigration reform. Uh, I was not an attorney at that time, not licensed. I had to get my license to '87, 
And so we did about 500 of the immigration reform cases. It helped set the basis for the growth of the business community at that time. Uh, and everyone else I knew, but there was very few kids who were born here of Hispanic origin in Tennessee at that time. The maps show how small a population there was with Latino community at that time. So immigration was open to me as a space. I think I was probably the third immigration attorney here in Nashville. And I've always, uh, con and I made the decision back in 98 to do just immigration cases. And uh, in terms of after the, um, the passage, of course, of the anti-immigration reform. And so it's, it's also the major law firms, most of them didn't want to do immigration because they were talking, oh, the Did courts not want different. to. Is that right? Did not want to do immigration. Right. They didn't want to do it. And so it created a space for me. It gave me the opportunity to create an immigration firm. Right? We had like 4,000 cases. So there's a lot of cases, a lot of people, always just grinding out cases day after day. You know, just really, it's, a, it's always a, a challenge to, to manage the cases and produce them and, and help people acquire their work permits, their, their green cards, their citizenship. You know, we call the triangle. The triangle, of course, being, you know, your family cases, your uh, visa cases, and then citizenship. And we do a lot of DACA cases. Always, we mentioned DACA is always ever present, but that is the challenge. And the challenge was how to create a firm, how to focus on creating a firm that survives also, and then how to focus in terms of what you want to do because there's so many areas you get drawn in so many areas. You got to focus in one area and, and not get drawn in too many places. Now, if I could go one thing, you talked about the growth of the community and what accelerated the growth. And I'll tell you a little story. Okay, uh, I used to go to court and I would with my clients and they would uh, plead guilty to no driver license. And after doing that several years, I got tired of going to court and just saying guilty, Your Honor, and I really wasn't helping my clients very much. So in roughly 1994, I began to recruit some of my friends and, uh, and, 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 and allies in the, in the different churches, and we created a group called Unamonos. Some of you may remember that, some may not, but we led the campaign to translate the driver license manual into Spanish. We fortunately uh, had a very friendly governor, Don Sunquist, who recently passed away, who helped us. We had help also from Doug's late Senator Douglas Henry, who was very instrumental. And we managed to get the driver's license made available in Spanish without a social security number. At that time, it was the only state in the country. So everywhere around the country began to move to Nashville. And it exploded. And it went from one day you could go to the Department of Safety and get a license. The next day, there was 2,000 Latinos in line at 6 oh, in the morning wow. or 5 in the morning. And that created a backlash. It really did. And then we lost the license at one point. Kept the booklet. The booklet's still there. We gave them a copy of the booklet. We got help from Opryland, West Union, to publish the booklet statewide. Uh, and then we went back and forth on the whole um, driver license thing in terms of available, not available. But it was copied by many other states, copied by California, Texas, all these different states, copied what we had managed to accomplish here. I remember as a kid in Tennessee, you could get a license in different languages. It used to be available. Because I remember when I was a kid, my, my parents got their licenses. So I remember it was. So in a sense, my memories of the past helped create what we were right now also. Great. Man, thank you. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Roxanne, tell us about your challenges, uh, getting your uh, restaurant business started, all your other businesses. Uh, you know, started from scratch? Yes, from yeah. scratch. Uh, on 1996. Um, it's a challenge, but... Uh, is at the same time it's easy now because you know 27 years um when i came to nashville uh, i was 18 and a half so i started to take my english classes to learn english and then a few years later i started working in a mexican restaurant in downtown so my goal was to start my own business and thank god you know we have it and uh, i am here and besides that, um, I'm just, um, besides do I do catering, I do a lot of corporate events for weddings and um, church events and things like that. I've been, uh, I was doing two banquet halls because I used to own a banquet hall in uh, South Nashville and I'm still in business. And now here's my son running the Lalo's Auto Sales. Great. Spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Lorraine, I have a really specific question for you. You're an entrepreneur. You're a force of nature. You're, I see you as a lens of connecting uh, the Hispanic perspectives into a number of businesses, a lot of uh, not-for-profits here in town that you serve. Can you talk about that role? Uh, my experience as an immigrant and participating in the, in the community in general, in the mainstream community, it's important. I think... Um, 
one of the struggles that we face in our community is that we may be, nowadays, we may be invited to be part of a conversation at a table, um, but it does not mean that they will let us speak. And in some cases, and at some meetings, um, they may let us speak, but may, they may not hurt our opinions or voices. And in, in some cases, they will hurt you. But what I believe is that, which is very important, and I think the professors, uh, hopefully you could agree with me, or you will agree with me, is that for us as a community, uh, immigrant community, minority communities, in order to um, acquire power, we need to be not only heard, but also our words, our opinions to be taken into action uh, so then we can actually acquire some social, political, and economic power. So the real influence is there. So we can actually make some real change because sometimes everything is, is on the surface and I don't think that that is enough, so. Great, thank you, thank you. You wanna talk about starting your business? Yeah. Starting the business was uh, not an easy task. My business is located in Laverne and is very reminiscent in Laverne of uh, archaic Nashville, the old ways, how it used to be. <laughs> so being, um, you know, obviously of Latino descent, it was still very, um, I wouldn't say difficult, but it was very head scratching, having to deal with the permit people and the county people. And, you know, it was just, not very fun, but nothing in life that is good for you is for your future is easy. So it was obviously very well worth it. But yeah, it was definitely quite the task. So did you meet some racism along the way? I did, yeah. yes, in every step of the way. But you know, we it's good to have friends in high places, so you gotta sometimes you gotta call in a helping hand to help oh, you out through those. Also your mother told you not to stop. <laughs> Keep going. Right. Well obviously that too, but no. We we, we have some other friends to help us, you know. <laughs> So then tell us about the explosion of Vera Art. Uh, how did it start? Uh, what are you guys doing now? Uh, please. Well, Vera Art, um, basically it was a project that he had a long time ago. I would say he came to this country in 2003, if I'm not mistaken. So he started, uh, after two years that he got into this country, he started doing painting murals, doing paintings doing face paintings, doing a lot of community service. That's something that I admire from him a lot. He does a lot of community service. Um, so Beta Art, I think, um, how long you say you started? ¿Cuánto hace cuánto tiempo que empezaste con Beta Art? 2003. So basically since he got to the States, he's been painting. Like I say, I just came along a couple of years ago, I would say uh, four years ago since we've been married. Um, but besides the murals that he does, he does a lot of, he showed me how to do jewelry. Also, he does sculptures, clothes alterations. Um, we have um, traveled many states. We have traveled to Michigan, Chicago, Florida, Georgia. I mean, like half of the states, I think we have. Uh, but his work, it's, it's based on Mexican folklore art. As you can see, it's very colorful. I mean. This is Manuel's, this is Manuel's. I mean, he's, of course, that's why we like him because he has good taste on clothing. <laughs> 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 we like the colors they use. Yeah. But it's uh, beta art, that's what it is. It's, uh, it's uh, what we do, colorful jewelry, painting, arts, canvas, anything that has to be with art, this man can definitely do it. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, for me to listen to the stories, this is, these are American stories, right? That's the whole point of this. That's coming to America because of the, it is a place where opportunity does exist, and it gives you an opportunity to expand and use your skills in a way that doesn't occur in other countries, praise the Lord. And so we're really, you all are shining examples of what can happen when you, when you land in the Athens of the South, or the music city as they call it now. I'm going to open it up. Any questions uh, from the audience? We've got some microphones here or comments at this point. R raise your hand. Raise your hand so I can see. Uh, if you see them, Yuri, I can't see yes. with the lights here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I've learned a lot. Um, my question would be in reference to political awareness and involvement. 
uh, normally when I go to different uh, retail stores or whatever, or you know, you go and check on your your health, your eyes, or uh, you know, vision or whatever, or you may go to your dentist or even you know your primary care physician. I've noticed that a lot of uh, uh, clients, or actually the employees, are Latinos or Latinx. And normally, you know, I'm I love political awareness, and I always get involved, and I always have my um, um, what is it, um, voters registration cards for them to fill out or whatever. And uh, most people that I meet, you know, they're very very intelligent. But then when I tell them don't forget to vote, you know, they'll say, well, I can't vote. And my thing is, you know, you have a, this professional position, you know, why are they keeping everyone from not being able to vote? And how can we change that? Because if you could get a work permit, uh, a green card, it should be some, and I think they even let you uh, be a, um, what is a donor? you know, for your kidneys or whatever. I mean, it should be some kind of way that uh, Latinos should be able to vote. Mario. Uh, well, yes, thank you, Mario. Well, actually, you're a really good question. You only have to be a U.S. citizen to vote in a federal election. So our city council could pass a, rest, a, a law or, I guess, or an ordinance where we call it here in Nashville and allow people to vote countywide. Now, I'm not sure how long that would last with the legislature currently in power, but, you know, certainly you could allow, in terms of local elections, non-U.S. citizens to vote. You know, it's really the Jim Crow laws eliminated the right to vote for non-U.S. citizens. That's one of the legacy things left over from the Jim Crow laws. That's one thing that has not been corrected. Unfortunately, when they passed the Civil Rights Act, they did not address that issue. Thank you. Thank you. We Thank have you. a question Good, here. Great question. Oh, sorry. Yuri. Yes. No, so I actually have a comment. Uh, on the one hand, I used to be a teacher, so for the historians up there, um, I connected with that on the level that I, uh, I went to when I was in a classroom, and you know, we, I had several English language learners in my classroom, but my overarching point is this. I have three sons. From the time they were growing up, I taught them how to speak Spanish. I speak Spanish. I'm rusty now. Don't ask me to speak. <laughs> But uh, I speak Spanish well enough to get by. But my whole point is that I taught them, encouraged them to speak uh, Spanish for several reasons. Number one, it's, uh, you know, when you, when you can understand somebody's language, it's understanding. You're communicating, you understand. Also, there's a connection. If you can communicate with people, you can connect with them, okay? So along with that, of course, my, the historian and me, uh, there's a book called They Came Before Columbus. It's by an author called Ivan Van Sertima. And I would encourage you guys to read that book because it talks about uh, the, the presence of ancient Africa, well, Africans in ancient America. That means the Omecs, the Mayans, et cetera. So the reason why I bring that up is because I'm encouraging everyone, too, to learn about not only the, the struggle of black Americans in, in, in America, because we have parallels with one another, okay? There's parallels, but it starts all the way back to the Omec heartland. Okay, the presence of Africa long before enslavement in the United in, in America. So I just you know it, so basically I'm just making the point of uh, first of all, I, I, I admire you guys too mo being multilingual. I think is awesome. Again, I encourage my children to be multilingual. I think people are very smart that can speak multiple languages. I'm impressed by you when you you went all the way back to the uh, indigenous Peruvian language. So I appreciated that myself. So just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another we have question? time for one raise more. One hand. more question, Yuri. Do you see? I, I can't. Please raise your hand. Do you have a question? Raise your hand. Here we go. Yes. Uh, hello. I was just wondering if you guys have, um, for the anthropologists, if uh, you had any interviews with non-Hispanics regarding their either a shock or how Nashville has changed for them uh, in regards to um, the huge diversity coming to Nashville, uh, what stories or what things uh, stand out for them? Sorry, you asked if it would, did I talk to non-Latinos about? Yeah, so the I had a particularly memorable interview with a teacher who retired from Metro 
and uh, as a white passing Latino person, she didn't realize that I was of Guatemalan and Mexican ancestry, and she let me know what she thought, and it wasn't good. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing in that interview uh, to me was that, you know, she she mentioned to me that she was surprised that the the Mexican kids also went to church. And so there was a perception there of, I didn't realize there was commonality because I was so aware of linguistic and racial difference. I would say with a lot of the Metro, I talked to a lot of Metro teachers and others uh, who worked around education, and there was a sense of this was enriching to the city and that there was an opportunity to see across difference and to build a more inclusive city, right? And and that um, that teacher, you know, in some ways, right, the, the kind of privilege of being white passing is I got to hear some of these negative uh, things, right? But it goes back to your, your prior question of the idea of resource scarcity, right? This perception that this new community might take something away. But I think when folks were able to switch that to see what was being brought, and I think we have wonderful examples of this here, of um, uh, enriched cultural life, that really seemed to change people's minds. So. Well, we're really at the witching hour. Thank you so much. What a great panel. Can we give everybody a hand here? Spectacular. So thankful for the comments. Great. As we close, I'd like to um, offer a couple of thoughts. Number one, the reason I was really so committed to, to do this uh, set of panels uh, over the course of this uh, academic year this year is that you can see the why. You can see the why. I mean, though we have a number of minority communities, their paths, their areas of the, how they've succeeded can be a little bit different, and their journeys and their challenges can be different. And the lessons we learn from them can be uh, different, such that we can share those as we grow as this great, magnificent city that we are. So I think as we continue this journey of looking at the history of our minority communities, you will learn more, see more, and hopefully walk away with some sense of how, where we've come from but, uh, and a sense of where we are now, but also how much more we need to do. I'd like to uh, make the case of some great books. <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting any uh, royalties here, but here's uh, Jamie's book. And I'm going to donate Check these. Them out at the library. I'm going to give these to the library. I'm giving these to the library, Rebecca, and uh, and really great. And uh, Andrea's book, The Succeeders. I love all the students to stand up because her book describes students as the succeeders. Please, students, please stand up. You know, these students are transforming Nashville as they take the history and the lessons of their parents and their ancestors and transforming it, uh, their communities and this city into something that's really great and, and grand. So I want to close by thanking everybody for coming. I want to thank uh, Rebecca Price and her spectacular National Public Library team and their support in this. I want to thank Yuri Kunza, my great new friend, who the CEO of uh, the Nashville Air of Hispanic Area Chamber of Commerce, Thank you. and all of my new friends that I've come in contact with here on the panel, phenomenal Nashvillians, phenomenal Americans. And then last, I want to thank Marla Robertson. Marla, you're still here, stand up. Marla is the glue from my office that works to pull all these pieces together. And uh, boy, she's going on vacation uh, this weekend. I'm going to be in trouble, but that's okay. But thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll, we'll end now, and please, uh, we can stay a little bit for uh, fellowship. But I understand we need to uh, be out of the building by 830. There you go. So thank everybody for coming. Thank you.